Due to the graphic content of certain portions of the following program, viewer discretion is strongly advised. London, England, 1988. A city of over 8 million people whose familiar sights like St. Paul's Cathedral, the Tower Bridge, and Big Ben have been symbols of Western culture for centuries. Exactly 100 years ago, within sight of these historic landmarks, a demon crawled out of the shadows and filled the city with a fear that still lingers today. In 1888, a sexually deranged killer turned the streets of London into his personal hunting ground. He murdered and brutally mutilated five women, all within a few blocks of each other in the Whitechapel district. But Scotland Yard's attempts to catch the murderer were futile. In a mocking letter to the police, the killer signed himself, Jack the River. But his true identity has been hidden for 100 years in the shadows of Whitechapel. Who was Jack the River? Rosalind Donston, a journalist with a penchant for black magic? Sir William Gull, the Queen's physician, did he brutally silence a blackmail scheme aimed at the royal family? Montague John Druitt, the son of an eminent surgeon whose own family thought he might be the Ripper. A man police called Aaron Kosminski. Though no photograph exists of this Whitechapel immigrant, he was named as a prime suspect in a sealed Scotland Yard file. Or was it the most controversial suspect of all? Queen Victoria's grandson, Prince Albert Victor, Duke of Clarence, an heir to the throne of England. The secret identity of Jack the Ripper. A special broadcast hosted by Peter Ustinov. With London field reporter, Jan Leeming. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Peter Ustinov. Good evening. In the next two hours, we will attempt to discover the secret identity of Jack the Ripper, one of the most notorious and elusive murderers of all time. Exactly a hundred years after he committed his crimes, we will attempt to unravel this intriguing mystery. And to accomplish this formidable task, we have assembled a panel of five internationally recognized crime experts. First, from the FBI, Special Agent John Douglas, an expert at criminal investigative sciences and a pioneer in creating psychological profiles of killers based on criminal behavior and evidence found at the scenes of the crime. Also with us is forensic pathologist, Dr. William Eckert, who has been a consultant on numerous well-known cases, including the identification of the remains of the Nazi war criminal, Josef Mengele. Dr. Eckert originally conceived the idea for our investigation tonight. From London, barrister Anne Malaliu, a practicing barrister for 20 years, she is one of an exclusive group of senior barristers appointed by the Queen as Queen's Counsel a high distinction indeed, and she has been a judge for five years. Also from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Special Agent Roy Hazelwood, an expert in criminal investigative analysis, he has been a consultant in hundreds of violent crime investigations throughout North America and Europe. Mr. Douglas and Mr. Hazelwood will share with us their state-of-the-art FBI profile of Jack the Ripper. And finally, representing Scotland Yard, Mr. William Waddell. In addition to being a criminologist for 30 years, he is curator of Scotland Yard's Museum of Crime, the famous Black Museum. Before the turn of the century, the Scotland Yard files on the Ripper case were sealed, leading to charges of cover-up and conspiracy. Standing by with the files in London is our London field reporter, Jan Liming. Good um, morning, Jan. 
Good morning, good evening. These files contain the 100-year-old documents that comprise Scotland Yard's evidence on the Jack the Ripper murders. And later, we'll learn the names of the men Scotland Yard identified as the prime suspects in the case. Thank you, Jan. Jack the Ripper has become a household word. But the cruelty of his deeds has been largely forgotten. In truth, he was a serial killer who brutally murdered five helpless women. 100 years ago, the Whitechapel district of London was a center of poverty. Thousands of people lived in crowded and unsanitary conditions. Many were Jewish immigrants who had fled racial persecution in Eastern Europe. The destitute and homeless of Whitechapel rented beds for four pence a night in rundown lodging houses known as DOS houses. Many of the women turned to prostitution in an effort to survive. Over 1,200 prostitutes walked the streets of Whitechapel, where they often serviced their clients outside in dark alleys. It was an environment in which Jack the Ripper had no trouble finding his victims. Oh, all right, I'll get you rotten money. Just keep the bed. On the night of August the 31st, 1888, a 42-year-old prostitute named Polly Nichols was thrown out of her DOS house because she didn't have the fourpence to pay for her bed. Polly Nichols was married when she was 12 years old. She left her husband when she was about 29, and she's got five children in the background. A uh, description of her, she's got sort of black wool stockings, patched boots, five teeth missing, um, brown hair turning gray. As Polly set off in search of a customer, she met a friend, Emily Holland. Oh, hello, Emily. I've been thrown out. I haven't got the fourpence. Oh, okay. She Just was drunk. And, and uh, she was wearing a, a hat. And she said, uh, see what a jolly bonnet uh, I've got. I was, I was, basically, I'll soon get a new customer. And so she went sort of weaving away down, uh, down, down the Whitechapel Road. And uh, somewhere along the line, she met Jack the Ripper. Shortly before 4 a.m. on that night, two men, Charles Cross and Robert Paul, were each making their way to work down Bucks Road. Cross saw what he thought was a bundle of clothing near this gateway between those buildings. On closer inspection, the two men realized it was a woman. They went in search of a police constable. Unknowingly, they were the first to discover that a murderer was at work in London's East End. As Cross and Paul went in search of help, Police Constable John Neal entered Bucks Row from the opposite direction. Neal had patrolled this same street just 30 minutes before, and all had been well. Come on, Missy, you can't sleep here. Come on, you ladies of the night, come on down, please. Come on, Miss. PC Neal, on beat duty, came into the road from the east, and shining his lantern over it, saw what they'd missed. God almighty. That her throat had been cut twice deeply back to the spine from left to right, and she was dead. A local surgeon, Dr. Ralph Llewellyn, was called to examine the body. He stated that Polly had been murdered at 3.30 a.m., one hour after she had left the Doss house. There was no trail of blood leading to or away from the body. Llewellyn determined that Polly had been killed where she lay. This examination took less than 20 minutes. It shows how sort of casual and limited sort of police investigation was, I mean, the limitation of scientific age, because a doctor just came along, certified death, um, body was picked up, taken to the workhouse mortuary, uh, a bucket of water was thrown over the blood, and that was the extent of the, uh, of the investigation at that point. It wasn't until the next day when uh, the body was stripped in the workhouse mortuary by a couple of the inmates that they found, in fact, that she had been uh, mutilated, that she had been ripped. There was a great gash running from her breastbone to her abdomen. Her intestines were slightly protruding, and there were two stabs in her groin. It was not unusual for women to be raped and have their throats cut, I'm afraid, on the streets in the Victorian slums. It was very unusual for them to be mutilated in that way after death. <laughs> 
An elderly insomniac named Mrs. Perkis lived in that room there, less than 10 yards from the scene of the crime. She was awake all night, pacing her room, and yet she heard nothing. No screams, no scuffles. No one heard or saw a thing. How could Jack the Ripper kill so savagely, yet so silently? Why didn't Polly Nichols cry out? And with three men approaching from different directions, how could the Ripper have fled into the night without being seen? Scotland Yard was baffled. Polly Nichols was carrying everything she owned on the night she died, a comb, a pocket handkerchief, oh, and a broken piece of mirror, her only means of seeing herself. Well, the police immediately ruled out robbery as a motive for the crime. Dr. William Eckert is the founder of the Milton Helpen International Center for the Forensic Sciences. Uh, Dr. Eckert, how could such a brutal murder have taken place without the victim uh, making a sound? I think basically the, the element of surprise at rapid action. No doubt he put his hand over her face, took a knife, and just ripped it across. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Eckert. Just seven days after the murder of his first victim, Polly Nichols, Jack the Ripper struck again. His second victim, Annie Chapman, was no wilting flower. Get in my bar of soap! You're a thief! You can't! Four days before her murder, she was seen trading punches with another prostitute, Eliza Cooper, over a bar of soap. Cooper would later recall the fight at the coroner's inquest. I had a quarrel with her on Tuesday before she was murdered. We got to quarreling over this piece of soap. I struck her in the left eye, I believe. I saw afterward that the blow I'd given her had marked her face. I find Annie Chapman the saddest of the victims. She was in poor health. She had inflamed membranes uh, in the brain. The doctors thought she would have died fairly soon in any case. What do you want? Uh, Jen, love. Yeah. She was, um... Plain, heavily built, oh, no. strongly built, very strongly built. Uh, I think probably rather a masculine looking woman. Um, there's a report that she was called Dark Annie, known as Dark Annie. Oh, I've had enough of you. Look at you, you're just fat right. and you're ugly. And She'd deep. been married to a coachman in Windsor, and then after his death, came back to the East End, lived from hand to mouth doing some crochet, selling flowers, selling herself. This is Hanbury Street, where Annie Chapman was last seen talking with a stranger 30 minutes before she died. This side of Hanbury Street is much the same as it would have been 100 years ago. But number 29 Hanbury Street, where Annie Chapman's body was found, has been replaced by a brewery. 17 people lived in a tiny house that stood here. On Saturday at 6 a.m., an elderly lodger named John Davis stepped into the yard to relieve himself and discovered Annie Chapman's body alongside the fence. Had he stepped into the yard a few minutes earlier, he would have met Jack the Ripper. Moments later, John Davis and his neighbors summoned a local constable. Sensing they were just minutes behind the killer, the police hurried to examine the evidence. Rumors of the Ripper's second killing had spread throughout Whitechapel, and a small crowd gathered in the passageway leading to Annie's body, yet no one would enter the yard where she lay. Come on, come on, out of the way, come on, out of the way. That grim task fell to Inspector John Chandler. Annie Chapman's body was lying at the foot of the stairs, parallel to the fence, with her feet pointing away from the building. The throat had been cut in two places, again almost back to the spinal cord. Uh, her clothes had been pushed up. 
and uh, she'd been ripped from the rectum up to the breastbone, and part of the intestines had been lifted out and dumped on the ground beside her. Inspector Chandler found several items laid next to Annie Chapman's body. On the ground between her feet were three coins, a comb, and a piece of muslin. Near her head, he found a piece of paper containing two pills and an envelope with markings of a military regiment. There were bloodstains on the fence about 14 inches up from the ground and immediately opposite the woman's neck. Again, there were no signs of a struggle. Once uh, the people in the house realized, in fact, that there was a murder in the backyard, they and the people in the adjacent houses uh, started renting out the windows at the back of the houses so that they could look down into the yard and see the police investigation. There was one particularly interesting clue. Opposite the body, lying in a pan of water, was a leather apron. It was the kind of apron that might be worn by a cobbler, or perhaps a butcher. There was a man living in the area, a man called John Pizer, who, according to one of the police investigators, was also known as Leather Apron. And he immediately became number one suspect uh, after the Annie Chapman murder. Finding the leather apron by Annie Chapman's body promoted the huge press hullabaloo and started the anti-Semitic action because leather apron was Jewish. Jews began to be beaten up on the streets. There was a danger of serious rioting and the police had to act on that. Scotland Yard was under pressure. Racial tensions were high and the police had two unsolved murders with few clues to guide them. But in the case of Annie Chapman, there were witnesses. A carpenter named Albert Kadosh lived next door to the murder site. He went into his yard at 5.20 a.m. and heard a woman utter a single word, no. It came from the exact spot where they discovered Annie Chapman's body. He also heard what he described as a sort of fall against the fence. The investigators later concluded this was Annie Chapman's body and that Kadosh was standing only a few feet from Jack the Ripper as he silently murdered her. They later learned that another eyewitness, Elizabeth Long, had actually seen the murderer. Elizabeth Long passed 29 Hanbury Street just minutes before the murder. She saw a man and a woman talking. She later described the man at a coroner's inquest. He had on a brown deerstalker hat and a dark coat. He looked over 40 and a little taller than the woman. He looked like a foreigner. He had a shabby, genteel appearance. I could hear them talking. He said to her, will you? She said, yes. For the first time, London had a description of Jack the Ripper. On September the 10th, 1888, the suspect known as Leather Apron, later identified as John Pizer, was arrested. But on the night of each murder, he had an ironclad alibi. John Pizer was cleared of all charges. Now, Jan Leeming is in London with historian and City of London police officer Donald Rumbelow, author of Jack the Ripper, The Complete Case Book. Donald, you have what is purported to be the knife used by Jack the Ripper. Now, why would Scotland Yard have regarded this as the actual knife? Uh, originally, this was in one piece. It was one of a pair. It was originally bright, sharp, and very new, and came in a box with a blood silk, uh, silk lining, blood stained silk lining. And it came from Hugh Pollard, who was one of the Yard scientific advisors. And it suggests that Scotland Yard obtained this uh, from the effects or the family of one of the suspects. What kind of knife is it? It's a post-mortem knife. The blade is eight to nine inches long, and that's the length of blade that the Ripper was using. It's 
a post-mortem knife with a thumb grip on the blade, and it's designed specifically for cutting upwards. If it were the Ripper's knife, what would it tell us about him? It would suggest that he had access to medical equipment or that he or his family had a medical background. Shortly after the elusive Whitechapel killer murdered his second victim, Annie Chapman, police received a letter written in blood-red ink, signed Jack the Ripper. Panelist William Wardell is a criminologist for Scotland Yard and the curator of the Yard's famous Black Museum. Uh, Mr. Wardell, just a few weeks ago, people everywhere learned that a letter, which had been lost for, I gather, 50 years, signed Jack the Ripper, was turned over to Scotland Yard. And you are, in fact, the man who received that letter. Do tell us about it. Well, in November last year, I received a brown envelope, which contained a number of documents that had been missing for about 50 years. One of them was the so-called Dear Boss letter, which is dated the 25th of September, 1988. What is unique about this letter is that it is the first time that the name Jack the Ripper was ever used. Well, many people believe that these letters are authentic. Were any of the letters received by the police written by the killer, do you think? Well, in carrying out an analysis of the writing, it is apparent that it is written in street language. It's deliberately contrived to make it appear that the writer knew something of the crimes. But they are not the words of a psychotic killer. Uh, this letter and others have been analysed by the Home Office Forensic Science Laboratory. And if I may quote uh, Dr Totty, the assistant director, he states in a letter to me that all the letters are hoaxes and quite irrelevant to the aim of determining the identity of Jack the Ripper. Yes, they sometimes seem too illiterate to be true. Thank you very much, Mr Wardell. Mr Douglas and uh, Mr Hazelwood. Based on your profile of Jack the Ripper, which we will learn more about later, uh, would the killer indeed have written the letters Mr. Waddell was telling us about? Well, there are some uh, serial killers today that will communicate with the police, and they like to do this to show that their superiority over us. For example, the Son of Sam killer in New York, the Zodiac killer out here in, in San Francisco. However, this particular killer does not have the criminal personality type that would feel compelled to write to the police or the media and want to inject himself into the investigation. The handwriting, by our analysis, appears to be disguised. The person authoring this communication has much too much intelligence, uh, extremely bright uh, individual, and very, very logical and rational thought process. And consequently, from an investigative perspective, we would de-emphasize this as a, a viable lead in the investigation. Yes. Do you agree with that? I concur with John's assessment. This type of individual seeks to avoid attention, and he would certainly not have wanted the publicity that would have followed the receipt of those letters. I see. Well, uh, thank you very much, both of you. We'll come back to you later. Hundred years later, the question remains, who was Jack the Ripper? Historians, experts, and criminologists believe that there are five widely accepted suspects who deserve examination. Dr. Roslyn Donston, a self-proclaimed Satanist who practiced black magic. He claimed to know Jack the Ripper and even wrote articles detailing the motives of the killer. Many believe Donston didn't merely know the Ripper, but that he was the murderer himself. Montague John Druitt, an unsuccessful lawyer who turned to teaching for a living. He came from a family of physicians Druitt is placed at the top of Scotland Yard's list of suspects and was believed to be Jack the Ripper even by members of his own family. Sir William Gull, Queen Victoria's physician and the central figure in what came to be known as the Royal Conspiracy. Many believe Gull and two others murdered the five prostitutes because they were threatening to blackmail the royal family. Prince Albert Victor, Queen Victoria's grandson and an heir to the throne of England. He was implicated by a respected physician who claimed in 1970 to have seen the prince's medical records. Those records indicate Prince Albert Victor was Jack the Ripper. 
And finally, Kosminski, a poor, insane Polish immigrant who lived in the East End. He had a well-known hatred for women and strong homicidal tendencies. He was placed in an insane asylum shortly after the Ripper killing stopped. Uh, there are no photographs of him. He too was named by Scotland Yard as a prime suspect. These are the five men who have emerged throughout history as the central suspects in the Jack the Ripper murders. Fear spread through the Doss houses of Whitechapel in the days following the Ripper's second murder. One woman was heard to lament bitterly. No one cares about us. Perhaps it'll be one of us that'll be killed next. Her name was Liz Stride, and two weeks later, she became the Ripper's next victim. On September the 30th, at 1 a.m. in the morning, Louis Diemschutz was returning home from his work as a seller of cheap jewelry to the men's drinking club he operated with his wife. He was pulling into the narrow courtyard that led to the club when his horse was frightened by something and hesitated to pass. At first, Diemschutz was not sure of what he had found. Looking closer, however, he could see that it was a woman, and in the darkness, he made two assumptions, uh, that she was drunk and that she was his wife. He left her to sleep it off. But when he found his wife drinking inside the club, Dean Schultz returned for a closer look. The woman was dead. It was Elizabeth Stride. Her throat had been cut once, lightly, from left to right. The two previous victims had been cut twice, deeply. The assumption is that the murderer was interrupted by hearing Dean Schutz approaching. Probably the Ripper was actually standing behind the gateway as uh, Diemschutz went to get a light, and then he, uh, the Ripper made his escape. Get everybody back. Liz had a, uh, a corsage of flowers um, pinned, to her, pinned to her dress. Uh, she was still clutching uh, a, a packet of cashews in her hand. Police deduced that there had been no struggle because the corsage was not damaged and the cashews not scattered. Get back, I say. As the police rightly assessed, when the Ripper was interrupted, as a maniac with an obsession to mutilate, he was frustrated. He went on and found another victim. He went over to Mitre Square, where he found what I find the most charming of his victims. Oh, man, it got Catherine Eddowes was in her 40s, and early on that evening of 29th of September, she was drunk out of her mind. Now, the city police did not make a fuss about drunks. One o'clock, she was released as sober enough to go back home. She went out and proceeded to meet Jack the Ripper. Take me back to London quickly as you can. Oh, Mr. Porter, what a lucky girl I am. Mitre Square was patrolled every 15 minutes by a policeman, Police Constable Watkins. And the funny thing about Mitre Square is that it had an echo on it. So that in Victorian times, when it was patrolled every 15 minutes, the policeman was only out of hearing of the square for about seven or eight minutes of that time. Police Constable Watkins went through the square at about half past one. When he came back through the square at quarter to two, there was Catherine Eddowes lying in a corner of the square. The body of Catherine Eddowes was in an absolutely terrible state. Her throat had been cut lightly, once again, from left to right. But then, not only had she been disemboweled, her abdomen had been savagely stabbed around inside. There were slashes on the liver, slashes on the pancreas. One kidney had been removed. Her womb had been removed violently. Uh, there was blood, there was excrement around. It was dreadful. Bill. I'm coming. I'm coming. Bill. You heard any noise? No. Don't know where it is. A night watchman who was on duty in a building facing the square 
had heard nothing. The fourth murder had been committed without signs of struggle in less than seven minutes. Watkins blew his whistle, summoned up lots of reinforcements. The police came, and the Ripper was now heading back into Whitechapel. According to the Assistant Commissioner of London Police, detectives found blood still swirling in the water of a sink where the Ripper had stopped to rinse his hands. There were many clues left by the murderer that evening, but of the Ripper himself, there was no sign. They found uh, a piece of apron, Catherine Edo's apron, with the marks of the knife on it, where he wiped the blood from, uh, from the knife. The piece of apron was found by the police several blocks from Mitre Square. Its discovery linked the Ripper to a mysterious message scrawled on the bricks directly above where the apron was found. The Jewes are not the men that will be blamed for nothing. Had this mysterious message been written by the Ripper? If so, what did it mean? Sir Charles Warren was commissioner of the Metropolitan Police investigating the Ripper murders. Everyone agreed that the message was a valuable clue, and yet Sir Charles did something that surprised the entire city. He rubbed out the message before a photograph could be taken. He was afraid that it might start an anti-Jewish riot when the morning foot traffic began. Yet it only needed an hour for enough light for a photograph to be taken. So adamant was Sir Charles that the message be removed, he came to this spot and rubbed it out himself. Did Sir Charles destroy a harmless piece of graffiti unrelated to the crime that might have inflamed an anti-Semitic mob? Or did he destroy a valuable clue? Battered by a storm of criticism, Sir Charles resigned three weeks later. The night of the double murder, there were several important witnesses who claimed they saw Jack the Ripper. They each described him as between 28, 35 years old, with a moustache, he wore a dark overcoat, and a brown deer stalker hat. One witness said he carried a parcel about six inches by 18 inches, wrapped in newspaper like this one. Our first suspect is Dr. Rosalind Donston, a journalist who had studied medicine and lived in Whitechapel. He came to the attention of the police during this reign of terror. Donston practiced black magic, worshipped Satan, was a drug addict, and gave himself the charming nickname, Sudden Death. In a notorious article for the Pall Mall Gazette, Donston advanced the shocking theory that the Ripper killed to obtain body parts for black magic rituals. In some of these black magical ceremonies, the parts of a harlot were regarded as, as having special powers. They could be used of the, they could be used in the rituals. The skin could be used. They could actually be made, some of the fat could be rendered out and made into, with other fats, into form of a candle which was burned at a particular point. In his article, Donston described the Ripper's black magic procedures in uncanny detail, one might even say with enthusiasm. Serial murderers often have a compulsion to revel publicly in their crimes. Donston's Ripper article may have been an example of this classic form of exhibitionism. They like to talk about their murders, but they like to do it in such a way that deflects suspicion away from them. Dunstan said that he actually knew who Jack the Ripper was. And in fact, he spun a yarn about this and actually went to Scotland Yard and made an accusation against a fellow doctor. Dunstan was a very clever, cunning person. By going to the Yard, by making a statement about the Ripper, he could talk about his own crimes. At the same time, he made himself one of those suspects that you begin to write off. Oh, not him again. Not that yarn again. Those who knew Donston took him more seriously. 
Vittoria Kramers shared a Whitechapel flat with him, and after a conversation with his mistress had aroused her suspicions, she searched his room. Donaldson was suspected of being the Ripper by his mistress, Mabel Collins, who said that he told her things and showed her things that convinced her utterly that he was the Ripper. In Donston's room, Kramer's found a small metal trunk. Inside were several neckties, and each was covered with a dark, crusty substance. To Kramer's, it looked like blood. Had Donston worn these ties while committing the five savage murders? I think they may have had a fetishistic connection. In other words, he may have wiped his hands on them. And some serial murders do this. They keep an article of clothing or lock of hair or something, one of their victims. And when going back to it, they recreate the impulses that they did on the time, the ecstasy, the orgasm, perhaps. All those things, the excitement, the fear, that were associated with that murder. And later on, Alistair Crowley came into possession of that trunk. Alistair Crowley is regarded as the father of modern Satanism, and he participated in black magic rituals with Donston. Crowley never specifically identified Donston as the Ripper, but Crowley did say he knew the murderer. When referring to the box of ties, Crowley said that they had belonged to Jack the Ripper. In the winter of 1888, after the final Ripper murder, Donston experienced a dramatic religious conversion. He became a pious Christian and spent the final years of his life writing a scholarly analysis of the Gospels. The passage of time, 100 years to be exact, has allowed us to forget how gruesome the Jack the Ripper murders were. His final murder was the most horrible of them all. Five weeks after the double murder, Jack the Ripper struck again. The Ripper was actually working to some sort of internal time clock because the first murder took place on the 31st of August. The next on the 8th of September. The double event on the 30th of September. But then nothing happened on the 8th of October. Nothing happened on the 30th of October. But then he strikes again on the 8th of November. And this time the victim is a woman called Mary Kelly. You look very pretty tonight. Pretty enough for fourpence. At 2 a.m. that morning, a friend of Mary's, George Hutchison, saw her talking with a man police believed was Jack the Ripper. Just leave the Hutchinson was so intrigued by this man that uh, as Kelly and uh, the client walked past him, uh, Hutchison bent down and sort of tried to peer under the hat uh, to see into the man's face. He's described in sort of in his mid-30s, he's got a hat sort of pulled down over, uh, uh, over, over his face and wearing sort of a, a coat with an astrakhan collar and cuffs. Mary Kelly lived in Miller's Court, just three blocks from the yard where Annie Chapman was murdered six weeks earlier. At a coroner's inquest, George Hutchison testified that he followed the couple back to Mary Kelly's home. Come along, dear. Be comfortable inside. He reported that the couple entered Mary Kelly's courtyard sometime after 2 a.m. Hutchison stood outside the court waiting for Kelly's client to leave. Some experts speculate he was hoping Kelly would service him for free. He waited 45 minutes before deciding to leave. Had he waited a few minutes longer, he would have heard Mary Kelly's final word. Sometime about four o'clock in the morning, um, a woman living in the court, in Miller's court, heard a voice call out, murder. But those sort of cries were commonplace in the area. And so like any, anyone else who heard it, she just turned over and uh, went back to sleep. Mary Kelly was the only one who worked indoors, worked from a bed. Therefore, she was the only one who was undressed and the only one with whom he had the time to do absolutely everything he wanted to do. The next day, Mary Kelly's body was discovered. The body of Mary Kelly 
was the most appalling sight any policeman who had seen it ever saw in the whole of his life. It was on the bed in her little room. She was wearing a puff-sleeved chemise. All the flesh had been stripped off her face. All the flesh had been stripped off her chest down to the rib cage. All the flesh had been stripped off one thigh. Her throat was mangled. There were pieces of flesh on the bedside table. There was blood all over the floor. It was an absolutely frightful spectacle. The existing photograph doesn't really convey the sheer horror that every policeman's memoirs, if they saw it, conveys. To introduce our next suspect, we return to the public records office in London. Well, Peter, I have with me now Dr. David Thomas, who's keeper of the public record office. Dr. Thomas, these files have been the subject of controversy for years. Tell me, are there any secret files or files to which the public have no access? Well, if we had a pound for every time we've been asked this question, we'd be very rich. These are the files of the Home Office and the Metropolitan Police relating to the Ripper inquiry. There are no other government files about the Ripper. The Home Office and the police are quite confident that these are the only files. They're freely available. Anybody would be welcome to come and examine them. Dr. Thomas, thank you. Well, Peter, these files contain autopsy reports, police reports, and transcripts of eyewitness testimony. And this file contains what is considered to be the most important document of all, a document written by Sir Melville McNaughton, a leading Scotland Yard investigator with access to all the Ripper reports. And in it, he names his top suspects in the case. Uh, who is the first suspect named by McNaughton? I'll tell you in McNaughton's own words. A Mr. M.J. Druitt, said to be a doctor and of good family, who disappeared at the time of the Miller's Court murder and whose body, which was said to have been upwards of one month in the water, was found in the Thames on the 31st of December, or about seven weeks after the murder. McNaughton goes on to say, he was sexually insane, and from private information, I have little doubt but that his own family believed him to have been the murderer. Oh, dear. Thank you very much, Jan. So, our second suspect is Montague John Druitt. Let's examine his case. Druitt was, belonged to an extremely good family, a very distinguished family. Druitt's father was an eminent surgeon in Dorset. His uncle was a famous doctor. His cousin was a doctor who had a surgery in the Minarets, right in the Ripper district. And Druitt was brought up in a background where there were surgeries and doctors and surgeons and cutting up. And it is very likely that the weapon used on the women uh, was um, a post-mortem knife. He would have been able to get that quite easily. Seven weeks after the murder of Mary Kelly, John Druitt's lifeless body was washed up on the banks of the River Thames. Police determined it was suicide. When Druitt's body was found, Scotland Yard called off its Ripper investigation. When Druitt's body was found in the Thames, the police went to the various vigilante groups in the East End and said, it is all right, you needn't worry anymore. We have found uh, Jacques the Ripper, he is dead. He drowned himself in the Thames. So London is safe, you can call off your patrols. A suicide note found in the dead man's chambers revealed Druitt's fear that he was going insane. Did the horror of the bloodbath in Mary Kelly's room drive him to suicide? You could not go further than the last murder. Beyond Mary, Mary Kelly, there was nothing. He couldn't have returned to society. It, it cracked. It exploded. Um, it really was a sort of mental explosion. He came to pieces. And either he killed himself while he was insane, or, as I believe, at a trembling moment, he realized the appalling thing he had done. And he took his own appalling life and drowned himself. In his youth, Druitt pursued a legal career, but failed miserably. Penniless, he was forced to take a teaching position at Blackheath's Boys' School, but was later fired for undisclosed reasons. 
Experts speculate he had engaged in homosexual affairs with the young students. Blackheath was just minutes from the Ripper's murder scenes. These are Montague John Druitt's chambers, where he attempted to make a living as a lawyer. They are a 20-minute walk from Whitechapel and would have provided him with a nearby hiding place when fleeing the murder scenes. Many thought it odd that Druitt retained these offices while teaching full-time at Blackheath, some 12 miles away. In 1888, tunnels beneath the city streets ran from the heart of the Ripper district to a train station connecting with Blackheath. Some experts believe Druitt could have used these tunnels to flee the murder scenes. In the dark alleys of Whitechapel, Druitt could have easily approached his victims. During the murders, prostitutes, even however desperate they were, were going to be very careful about going with someone who looked like um, a murderer. Druid would have had charm, he'd have had the money, he'd have had the clothes, the good looks, and he'd have had the talk. They would have been much more likely to go off with him down a dark alley than they would with some crazed, black-bearded Polish butcher. Why was this educated son of a respected surgeon named by Sir Melville McNaughton as his top suspect? Why did his own family believe he committed these heinous crimes? And why did Scotland Yard's investigation stop when Druitt was found dead in the Thames? Was Montague John Druitt Jack the Ripper? There are those who question the way in which the investigation of the Ripper murders was handled by Scotland Yard. In fact, some people believe the police were involved in a cover-up, which brings us to our third suspect, Sir William Gull. The central figure in what has come to be known as the Royal Conspiracy. By 1888, Queen Victoria had reigned for over 50 years. English society reflected Victoria's personality. It was proud, dignified, and above all, proper. In 1978, Stephen Knight wrote a book that shattered the prim facade of Victorian England. It tied the royal family directly to the Ripper murders. According to the theory, Prince Albert Victor, Victoria's grandson and an heir to the throne, secretly married a commoner, Annie Crook. Even worse for the Protestant monarchy, Annie was a Catholic. According to Knight, they had a child named Alice. Rumor had it that Victoria was furious and ordered the affair broken up. The prince was reprimanded, but Annie Crook was locked away in an asylum until her death 32 years later. Their daughter, Alice, provides the link to the Ripper case. As a child, her nurse was allegedly Mary Kelly. Armed with her knowledge of the secret marriage and the love child, Mary Kelly attempted to blackmail the royal family. Knight claims that Kelly was joined in the blackmail by four other prostitutes, Polly Nichols, Annie Chapman, Liz Stride, and Catherine Eddowes. According to this theory, the five women were murdered in order to silence the scandal forever. But Alice Crook was still alive and she married Walter Sickert, the well-known British artist. They had a son, Joseph. Now, if this account is accurate, he is the unacknowledged heir to the British throne. In a 1973 BBC interview, Sickert went public with his story. Various people high in the government and the royal household became very worried, indeed, about the possibility of the news getting out. It was decided that Mary Jane Kelly would have to be silenced. The operation was undertaken by the driver, John Netley, and the royal physician, Sir William Gull. According to Sickert, Jack the Ripper is a myth, or rather a fraud. Sickert believes three men committed the crimes. John Netley drove Sir William Gull, the royal surgeon, and Sir Robert Anderson, head of Scotland Yard, into Whitechapel. Their mission was to find the women who were blackmailing the royal family. Gull and Anderson shared a fierce loyalty to the Crown, 
and a brotherhood in the Freemasons, a secret quasi-religious fraternal order. I have a flask of brandy here, but Can you make it worth my while? Of course we will, my dear. Have you got four pence? To the casual observer, it might have appeared the two gentlemen were engaging the services of various prostitutes. But according to Sickert, Garland Anderson sought out the five women one by one, brutally murdered and mutilated them, and left their bodies to be found in an increasingly terrified city. By the time all five had been murdered, Gull and his conspirators had successfully convinced London that the perpetrator was a lone madman, Jack the Ripper. Sickert also claims that the Jewess message was written by Gull or Anderson and ties them to the Ripper murders. The key is their brotherhood in the Freemasons. The Jewess are three pivotal personalities in the secret Masonic writings, and they are murderers. The Jewess were executed and then mutilated in ways strikingly similar to those of the Ripper victims. According to Sickert, Sir Charles Warren, who was also a Freemason, erased the Jewish message to protect the royal conspiracy. Today, Joseph Sickert still lives in London, a stone's throw from Buckingham Palace. At 62 years of age, he is still adamant about his royal heritage. Uh, my grandmother, and Elizabeth Crook, was married to Albert Victor Christian Edward, Prince of England, the heir presumptive to the throne. English history is filled with battles for control of the throne. Were these brutal murders another version of this age-old struggle for power, disguised as the bloody work of Jack the Ripper? The inscription on the Jewish wall remains a mystery to this day. Could the writer have written Jewish as a misspelling of Jews? Did Sir Charles Warren erase it properly to prevent an anti-Semitic riot? Or was the word Jewish a reference to Masonic law? The Jewish, incidentally, were three men convicted by none other than King Solomon of murder and condemned to be disemboweled and have their entrails thrown over their shoulder, which was exactly the condition of one of the Ripper's victims. Did Sir Charles erase this message to protect his fellow Freemasons? We may never know. We do know that the royal family has been implicated in the Jack the Ripper mystery for years. Our next theory involves many of the same players, but in vastly different roles. And the suspect is Prince Albert Victor, Duke of Clarence, Queen Victoria's grandson. At this time, however, he is not a lovesick pawn in a conspiracy, but rather is named as the killer himself. It began in an article published in this magazine, The Criminologist, written by Dr. Thomas Stowell, appeared on the 1st of November, 1970. The day after its publication, over 2,000 newspapers around the world reported that Prince Albert Victor had been implicated as Jack the Ripper. Within one week, Dr. Stowell ran a retraction in the Times of London. The next day, he died. At the time of the Ripper murders, Prince Albert Victor, affectionately known as Eddie, was 28 years old. Pictured here in a deerstalker hat, he closely resembles eyewitness descriptions of the Ripper. His doctor was the trusted physician of the royal family, Sir William Gull, implicated by some in the royal conspiracy we examined earlier. Gull kept meticulous diaries, carefully detailing the treatment of his aristocratic patients. Dr. Stowell read these diaries and shared his findings with author Colin Wilson. What Stowell told me was that it was quite obvious that Gull knew a great deal about Jack the Ripper, all kinds of references to the Ripper. He said when he read them very carefully, there was some reference about the Duke of Clarence coming in with blood on his shirt, 
um, late at night to Gold's residence in Park Lane. And he said um, it was perfectly obvious that the Duke of Clarence was Jack the Ripper. Gull's diaries reportedly said that Prince Albert Victor contracted syphilis while traveling abroad. And during insane fits of rage brought on by the disease, the prince killed four Whitechapel prostitutes. After the double murder, Sir William Gull allegedly found the prince wandering in the East End and at the request of a horrified royal family, locked him away in a lunatic asylum. Three weeks later, the prince escaped and returned to murder Mary Kelly. He was recaptured, and Albert Victor was reconfined to the asylum, where he died four years later. This is Buckingham Palace, one of many palaces where Eddie would have played as a child, and where, if he were the Ripper, he might have returned home after the gruesome murders. Officially, he died of influenza, but some authors believe he died of syphilis, which drove him insane and drove him to murder. Around the world, there's a theory that Jack the Ripper is connected with royalty. Queen Elizabeth's response to this theory is rubbish. Rubbish, perhaps. Yet still, the theory persists. To examine our fifth and final suspect, we turn once again to the files of Scotland Yard. His name was first made public in the same document that incriminated Montague John Drury. And Jan Leeming is in London with the file. And in it is a document written by Scotland Yard detective Sir Melville McNaughton. Here's what he wrote about our next suspect. Kosminski, a Polish Jew, resident of Whitechapel. This man became insane owing to many years of indulgence in solitary vices. He had a great hatred of women, especially of the prostitute class, and had strong homicidal tendencies. He was removed to a lunatic asylum about March 1889. McNaughton concludes by saying, and I quote, there were many circumstances connected with this man which made him a strong suspect. Thank you, thank you very much, Jane. Obviously, this mysterious immigrant, Kosminski, bears investigation. Kosminski was one of the thousands of poor immigrants residing in Whitechapel. He was so far out of the mainstream that not even a photograph exists of him. And yet, Kosminski is the suspect who emerges when we look behind the scenes at the police investigation of Jack the Ripper. Sir Robert Anderson was head of Scotland Yard at the time of the Ripper murders and in charge of the entire investigation. Chief Inspector Donald Swanson was appointed by Anderson to oversee the case. These two knew more about the murders than anyone, except the Ripper himself. By the time of the fifth murder, the police had interviewed dozens of potential suspects and followed up even the smallest clues. A handful of eyewitnesses had given descriptions of the Ripper that had helped the police focus their search. But one eyewitness finally came forward whose testimony was so precise that it led police back to one particular suspect. According to Swanson, the suspect was taken out of London to a police safe house called the Seaside Home. There, the key eyewitness was waiting. Anderson wrote his memoirs years later describing the dramatic confrontation of witness and suspect as follows. The only person who had ever had a good view of the murderer unhesitatingly identified the suspect the instant he was confronted with him. However, Anderson goes on to say, the witness refused to give evidence against him. It must have been a bittersweet moment for Anderson, 
He had solved the case, and yet he couldn't prosecute because the witness would not testify in court. But by the time he wrote his memoirs, Anderson seems to have accepted his disappointment in the Ripper case. He wrote, I am almost tempted to reveal the name of Jack the Ripper, but to do so would serve no public good. Still, we are left with the frustrating question, who was this unnamed suspect? A recently new evidence has come to light that answers this question. And to examine it, we go once again live to Jan Leeming in London. Well, Peter, with me now is crime historian Martin Fido, author of the book, The Crimes, Detection and uh, Death of Jack the Ripper. He has a piece of evidence which he thinks is going to solve this mystery. Martin, what is it? Well, this is Donald Swanson's personal copy of Sir Robert Anderson's memoirs. And as you can see, he's made notes on the Ripper case here in the margin. Now, Anderson was the man in charge of the case and Swanson was his deputy. That's correct. Yeah. So, so what do these notes or marginalia tell us? Well, you can see up here they say, uh, suspect had been identified at the seaside home where he'd been sent by us with difficulty. And down here you see he says, Kosminski was the suspect. Kosminski. Um, what does Swanson tell us about Kosminski? Well, he says he was sent to Stepney Workhouse and then to Coney Hatch. That's the local infirmary in the main London asylum. And died shortly afterwards. And when you go, as I did, to the records of those two institutions, you find there was an Aaron Kosminski from Whitechapel who went to both of them. But the records show he went in two years after the murders were over. He was a harmless imbecile with the delusion that instincts told him to eat bread from the gutters and never to take a bath. And what's more, he did not die when Swanson says he lived for 30 years in the asylum. Some discrepancy. How can you explain that? Well, I think there's no doubt that the man identified at the seaside home was Jack the Ripper. But I think the police made a mistake about his identity in the asylum. I have found another Whitechapel Polish Jewish lunatic in Coney Hatch named David Cohen, brought in by the police shortly after the murders, who seems to fit what Swanson says in many ways and died at the appropriate time. So you believe this man identified at the seaside home Kosminski or Cohen was Jack the Ripper? Beyond doubt. Let's recall the suspect. Dr. Rosalind Donston. He wrote a newspaper article describing the murders in surprising detail. He lived in Whitechapel. He had medical skill. He was involved in devil worship. His friends claimed he was Jack the Ripper. Montague John Druitt. He matched eyewitness descriptions. He committed suicide and the murders stopped. The investigation was called off when his body was found. He was suspected by members of his family. He was named in Scotland Yard's file. Sir William Gull, he was a surgeon. He could have had a motive to protect the royal family from blackmail. He was a Freemason for whom the Jewish wall may have held significance. He could have killed his victim silently in his coach. Prince Albert Victor, he also matched eyewitness descriptions. He was allegedly named in Dr. Gull's diaries. He was a hunter familiar with knives. He allegedly had syphilis and was going insane. And finally, Kosminski. He lived in Whitechapel. He had homicidal tendencies, hated women. He was named in Scotland Yard's files. He was allegedly identified by Swanson, the chief investigator. He was allegedly identified by a witness who curiously refused to testify. In a moment, our panel will tell us who they believe was Jack the Ripper. But first, let's take a quick poll to find out where everyone stands thus far. Dr. Eckert, as a pathologist, which of the five suspects do you believe was the least likely to commit these crimes? In my opinion, it was uh, uh, Dr. Gull, Sir William Gull, and primarily because he had been ill, it's, it's on record. Uh, he also 
uh, had a great reputation. Uh, and uh, uh, the technique that he used certainly was not a doctor. Uh, I, I think he'd be a, a very uh, limited possibility of being a uh, suspect. Good. And our attractive judge, Anne Malaliu, you're an experienced attorney. Which of the suspects would you most want to defend? Well, the prince, in my view, has far the best defense. He has a superb alibi for no less than three out of the four murder occasions. For the first two murders, it looks as if he was at Balmoral in Scotland, killing grouse and salmon rather than women. For the last murder on the 9th of November, he was certainly at Sandringham in Norfolk after pheasants on that occasion. After the last killing, far from being found insane and kept locked up, as Dr. Stoll has suggested until his death, three days after the murder, he was off on a state visit to Copenhagen. Nobody pointed the finger of suspicion at him until 1970. Not merely, in my view, is he plainly not the killer, but if those allegations had been made in his lifetime, he would have had a very substantial claim for libel damages. Do you approve of Her Majesty's rubbish? I would like her as a witness. Now, Mr. Waddell, as a criminologist with Scotland Yard, which suspect would you discount? Well, I've long believed that Druitt was the most likely suspect. But this has always been based on the fact, one, that he's in the McNaughton notes, and two, that there has been circumstantial evidence provided to say that he was in the right place at the right time. We can now disprove some of that circumstantial evidence. He's the most difficult suspect to eliminate because he's one of the most popular. But analysis of newly found material has decided in my mind that he is no longer the prime suspect. You've changed your mind. I have. Well, I think that's very laudable. And uh, uh, Mr. Douglas, uh, Mr. Hazelwood, which one of you will speak first? I will, sir. I have uh, eliminated Dr. William Gull also. Dr. Gull was approximately 52 years of age, and our experience with these types of mutilation murders indicate that much younger men commit these types of crimes. Secondly, a person of Dr. Gull's social standing would kill in a much less personal manner. He wouldn't relish getting blood on himself or his clothes. If he were to kill, he would do so in a more, much more impersonal manner, such as using a ligature to strangle, strangle the victims. Finally, it was reported that Dr. Gall had suffered a stroke two years prior to the commission of these crimes and was in poor physical condition at the time. Such crimes require a degree of strength which I believe Dr. Gull did not possess. You agree with that? I agree with it. I eliminated Dr. Donston uh, as, a, as a suspect, uh, although he was very odd. He was into the witchcraft and he lived in the Whitechapel area, had the medical skills and followed the investigation very, very closely. By today's standards, we see people like that who we refer to as police buffs in, in law enforcement who like to inject themselves into the investigation and provide us with bogus information to try to throw us off our, our path. However, he was, he was much too old, he was much too uh, educated, and as a student of witchcraft, you definitely would have seen uh, indications if he perpetrated a crime of, of his witchcraft. Uh, he would have preferred to take his victims to his preferred location rather than have a prostitute lead him to her preferred location. And the other thing which is very, very relevant is the fact that uh, uh, as a physician, after reviewing the autopsy uh, protocols and, and the medical uh, photographs, uh, the person who perpetrated this crime did not have the surgical skills or, or the expertise. So therefore, I would eliminate Dr. Donson. Mr. Hazelwood, uh, tell us briefly, if you will, uh, how the FBI creates its criminal personality profile. Absolutely. If you're allowed to Absolutely. tell Absolutely. To begin with, profiles are only uh, provided in unsolved crimes of violence, and they are written in a manner designed to help the police focus on a particular type of individual. Not a particular person, but a particular type of person. Mm. The creation of a profile begins with an analysis of all available documentation per pertaining to that particular crime. Uh, such documentation would include autopsy and investigative reports, maps showing significant locations, information pertaining to the victim, crime death scene photographs, and materials of that sort. Uh, from that documentation, we reconstruct the crime from the original confrontation between the killer and the victim all the way through the crime until the time he actually leaves the death scene. Uh, 
we study his behavior with the victim. In other words, what he did to the victim and how he did it. And from that behavior, we were able to elicit a motivation for the commission of that crime. Based upon that motivation, we then provide the police with characteristics of their unidentified offender, characteristics such as age, race, marital status, arrest history, educational or intelligence level, and other characteristics of that type. Uh, Mr. Douglas, how does this FBI profile, uh, how does it apply to Jack the Ripper? Well, Jack the Ripper was like a, a predatory animal. Uh, uh, he would go out seeking uh, victims who are weak, susceptible, uh, victims uh, of opportunity where he can carry out his grotesque sexual uh, fantasy on these, on these victims. Historians and criminologists as well as authors uh, kind of give us the impression that there was uh, uh, no pattern or looking for patterns in these crimes. And really you won't find patterns because these killers go out on the hunt nightly for the victims. And their downfall is, if you want to apprehend them, is that they go back to the scenes where they've been successful in the past. So they'll go in these areas, the crime scene areas, as well as the, the grave site. So if you want to apprehend him, you set up a surveillance at these two locations. Jack the Ripper was a, a white male. He was in his mid to late 20s of uh, very, very uh, average intelligence. And uh, Roy and I both believe that he really wasn't uh, that clever as he was lucky. Absolutely. Uh, Jack the Ripper was single, and he had never been married. In fact, it's probable that he's not socializing with women at all. He had a great deal of difficulty interacting with people and women in general. Also, the times that the crimes were committed between mid midnight and 6 a.m. would indicate he's not accountable to anyone, therefore not married. We believe that uh, Jack lived very close to where the crimes were being committed because these types of individuals generally start killing within very close proximity to their homes. And he was obviously very familiar with the area and lived there. If Jack was employed, it would have been a menial type of job, or a job requiring little or no contact with the public. Again, he uh, did not interact very well with people at all. He would certainly not be employed in a profession. As far as his criminal history goes, as a child, uh, Jack would probably have set fires or abused animals. As an adult, he would have engaged in erratic behavior, causing neighbors to call the police because of that erratic behavior. But I believe of more significance than the criminal history would be his mental history. Jack the Ripper was a, a product of a, a broken home. He was raised by a dominant uh, female figure in his household who in all probability physically, if not sexually, uh, abused him as a, as a child. And a way for offenders of this type, or, or for potential offenders of this type to cope with this is to internalize the feelings and, and withdraw themselves into society and become very, very asocial, uh, become quite a, a loner, and uh, withdraw from, uh, from the community. Uh, he would also be described as having very, very uh, poor personal hygiene. He would be disheveled in appearance. And people would notice that he was nocturnal, meaning he preferred uh, to go out during the evening hours under the cloak of darkness, stalking, walking many, many blocks, looking for potential victims. Jack uh, hated and feared at the same time women. He was also very intimidated by women. I'm sure everyone uh, noted how quickly uh, Jack would subdue and, uh, and kill his victims. And this is very important in understanding Jack because it tells us, in the fact he killed quickly, it tells us that taking of life was not of, of primary importance to him. That was of secondary importance to the mutilation itself. It was through the mutilation that we were able to understand that is actually the key to understanding Jack the Ripper. The mutilations were sexually motivated and by displacing the victim's organs, the sexual organs are mutilating them, he, in fact, neutered or de them, and therefore they're no longer anything to be feared. That's, that's really frightfully interesting. It's a form very British understatement to suggest that he killed five women because he felt uncomfortable, uncomfortable. in their company. Yes, Thank you very much, Mr. Douglas and Mr. Hazelwood. <music> Ladies and gentlemen, the moment of truth is upon us. For a hundred years, authors, historians, criminologists have been puzzled by the question, who was Jack the Ripper? Now, 14% of our viewers believe Dr. Rosalind Donston was the Ripper. 18% believe he was M.J. Druitt. 25% voted for William Gull and the Royal Conspiracy. 23% believe the killer was Prince Albert Victor and 20% believe Kosminski was Jack the Ripper. Turning now to the distinguished members of our panel, here is what the experts say. 
forensic pathologist William Eckert. It's my opinion that uh, uh, these crimes were committed by uh, someone with a, se a severe mental problem. I'm, I'm not a, uh, uh, a psychiatrist, but in, uh, in cases of a similar nature I've had, uh, it has been found that many of these people are uh, very badly mentally uh, troubled. Uh, I therefore uh, feel that our uh, most likely suspect here as the actual ripper uh, is uh, Aaron Kosminski. And uh, Anne Maladieu, member of the Queen's Council, barrister, judge. Well, I think there's insufficient evidence to actually charge anyone, uh, any one of these suspects, but the suspicion against Kosminski, I agree, is the strongest, and I think that for four reasons. Firstly, he lived locally and knew Whitechapel well. Secondly, the Middlesex Asylum Coney Hatch Hospital records suggests strongly that he was a paranoid schizophrenic. Thirdly, according to the police officers Anderson and Swanson, he was positively identified by a witness as someone seen with stride shortly before her death. And fourthly, according to Swanson, as soon as Kosminski was placed first of all under constant surveillance and then under restraint, the killings stopped. FBI Special Agent Roy Hazelwood. I would agree with the two previous opinions. I also believe Aaron Kosminski was responsible for these five mutilation murders. Of the five suspects, he was the only one who would not have been bothered by being sprayed with human blood. Uh, the others, I believe, would have been bothered by that. Also, his hatred of women is extremely well documented. And as I earlier stated, the mutilations uh, involved in these crimes were motivated by an exaggerated hatred of women. And from Scotland Yard, William Waddell. Well, a murder inquiry in 1988 is essentially the same as one 100 years ago. Uh, from the point of view of a police inquiry, I come out in favor of Kosminski being the suspect. The evidence in the McNaughton notes of uh, mentioning him his name initially and some of the evidence that's come to light since then uh, makes me feel that he's more likely than any of the others. And uh, Special Agent John Douglas of yeah, the not, FBI. Uh, not to sound repetitious, but from a behavioral point of view, I definitely believe uh, Kos Kosminski would fit the, uh, the general profile. Uh, if he didn't do it, someone just like him uh, in Whitechapel committed this crime. Well, there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. Experts for Donston, there are none. We are all unanimous that it was probably Kosminski. I say with great relief that we cannot at this distance be responsible for a miscarriage of justice. And thank you, Martin Fido, Donald Rumbelow, David Thomas, and Jan Leeming in London for all your help. And thanks to our panelists for engaging in this fascinating search for the secret identity of Jack the Ripper. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Oh. Sleep well. <laughs>